we could start. It's live on YouTube. Yay! It's Saturday Night Live. Iris? Yes. Is that you? Just started. Just want to say hi. Hi. Glad How are you doing, Iris? Night. I'm well. Good, good. I'm glad to hear. Good. Okay. Classical music. Okay, we did music. <laughs> We are ready to go, Iris. You can begin the meeting. All right, lovely. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, oh, let me open this here. So um, today, October 22nd, 7 p.m., um, call to order the Senior Issues Housing, Health, and Welfare Committee. We thank you all for joining us. And... Um, Shall we introduce ourselves or we go straight into the meeting? Joe, how would you? Usually we're around a table and it's easy to do this. Um, let me start off at least by saying that we do have a new committee member. Don't know if she's joined us yet. Marissa? Marissa, Marissa is here, yes. Marissa Hi, Perez. Marissa. Welcome. Welcome. So good to have you. Okay. Um, Thank you. Good to be here. So pretty much just for the format, what we'll be doing is we have a number of presentations this evening. And um, what we decided to do, because this is our first committee meeting in a while, and the reason for that you know, is COVID. Um, and yet, talking about health, welfare, senior issues, really looking around what's been going on in our community, what people have been doing individually to help, um, and some of our organizations. So we really wanted to hear from some people tonight um, to, to get an update of what you've all been doing and, and be able to share that with the community, particularly people who may be tuning in now. Um, and yeah, I think we were we were talking a little bit informally before we started streaming and talking about these last, you know, what is it, at least seven months now. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen or or get get to sense of is maybe how little we need, how much we have, and the importance of human connection. Um, so it is with those connections, with the supports that our wonderful community has. I want to introduce first Karen Tadros. Karen is president of Bay Ridge Cares, um, a wonderful volunteer-based organization that has done tremendous work um, over these months. And I actually had given Karen a call very early on, thinking about some, some right. needs. So, um, you know, I've been following everything you've been doing in the community. It's quite wonderful. And I'd like to give you the opportunity tonight to tell us about that, what you've been doing most recently, and then just an overview about your organization, because you've been around for quite some time now. And um, I think everybody, you know, we want to make sure everyone knows about um, your wonderful agency. Um, thanks so much for inviting me. First of all, it's a pleasure to join you all tonight. Um, many of you may or may not know what Bay Ridge Cares is and who we are. So I'll just give a very brief introduction as to how we began um, back in 2012 when Superstorm Sandy came barreling through. Uh, Bay Ridge was pretty much left, you know, unscathed. We really dodged the bullet there. And um, but everything, everyone, all the communities around us really suffered an enormous um, a loss of life as well as property and, and other kinds of losses, um, and mostly the ability to, to feed themselves. And so um, I actually got a call from Justin Brannon, who said to me, Karen, we need a kitchen. And you know, Justin, whenever he wants something, he always uses the word we, uh, which really means, <laughs> <laughs> which really means you know, I, I better find a kitchen. And thankfully, um, my church, St. Mary's Orthodox Church on Ridge Boulevard and 81st Street opened up their kitchen to us. And over 28 days, we cooked six days a week and we provided 25,000 meals to the entire, tri you know, bar all the boroughs. We were out in Queens, we were out in Staten Island, we covered all of Brooklyn, two shifts a day. 
uh, lunch and dinner, and it was healthy, nutritious meals. And from there, uh, you know, we decided that it's not a matter of, you know, if another storm comes barreling through, it's just a matter of when. And we wanted to be prepared um, when that happens or if it ever would happen. And so Bay Ridge Cares, we formed a 501c3. We got all of our, um, our not-for-profit status requirements done. And we've been acting as the Red Cross basically for the community for the past eight years and doing all kinds of different things, community cleanups. Um, we do a community pancake breakfast, much like a small town would at a firehouse, which is such so indicative of a small town to have a community pancake breakfast. Um, We've done, you know, more, most notably, uh, we did a full uh, renovation of the Fort Hamilton Senior Center. Um, we had gone in there one day just to drop off some stuff, some flyers, and we saw that the place was really um, in, in need of a facelift. So with coordinating with the Parks Department and forming, you know, a nice committee, we were able to renovate that space, give them a new lobby. We overhauled the entire kitchen. They got all new appliances, all new countertops. Um, they got you know, a working oven, which they had never had. And then we also uh, did some renovations of some of the common rooms. But um, if you go into the senior center, the work in that kitchen and everything around is the work of Bay Ridge Cares. But more importantly, the volunteers that we were able to engage for that project, which was well over 100 people over two weekends. Um, so, and that is, that I have to say is the strength of Bay Ridge Cares is the fact that we have in our database about 600 people who have volunteered, signed up to be volunteers for whatever project we might decide to put together. We'll send out an e-blast to all of them and then they can sign up through Sign Up Genius, which is what we use um, to, to wrangle all our volunteers in. Um, when COVID came along, um, it, we were really presented with a, a, you know, a problem because, um, we had a lot of pop-up little pantries in the community, but that did not address the seniors, the homebound, um, the disabled who could not go out to grocery shop. Many did not have the ability to order online. They did not know how, so you had this digital divide as well. Um, and then um, you couldn't call on the phone. You couldn't even call like Food Town to get a delivery because they weren't accepting them. It was a real problem. <clears throat> and so what we did was what, what we do best. We, we um, <clears throat> mobilized our volunteers. We had 400 people sign up in three days to, to, to really put an effort out. And, um, and then we got the word out. And, you know, the first two days we got maybe, you know, 10 people who said, yes, I need a delivery of food. Over the next 14 weeks, it, it really exploded. And so we delivered, we put together care packages of food. We partnered with a couple of stores in the community to make sure that what was going into these food packages was also nutritious. So not only did they get dry goods, but they got chicken, they got um, ground beef, they got fresh fruits and vegetables, they got fresh bread from a local bakery. Um, as well as cereals and other items. So whatever they got was, was something that was substantial. I mean, it's easy to send out pasta, rice, and beans, but you can't live on that, especially a senior who needs nutrition um, and usually sometimes doesn't even on, on, on their own provide enough nutrition for themselves. So we did that. Um, like I said, 500 deliveries went out. We also ran errands. We picked up... Um, you know, went to the post office, we went to the drugstore, we picked up a mop and broom for someone. I mean, one woman's shower curtain broke and she needed a new shower curtain. So these are the things we did. And then for every incoming call we made and everybody that we served, they went on our wellness call list. So once they received a food package from us, they would then were assigned a volunteer who would then call and check in on them every week from that point on. So we made about, I'd say probably about a thousand wellness calls. We also delivered masks to seniors who had no way of getting them. Um, we had a little old lady, Flora, a little Italian lady who uh, was sewing up, like I mean, sewing um, masks like nobody's business um, until her sewing machine needles broke and she couldn't go out to get them. So we Amazoned her some new sewing machine needles uh, and she continued to sew. 
So we were able to do that. But um, we also, uh, and Todd can speak of this, we also partnered up with a lot of um, other organizations who had seniors, but they had no way of getting food to them. Um, so they would call us. We worked with Catholic Charities quite a bit. We worked with uh, the Brooklyn Center quite a bit, the Bay Ridge Center, I'm sorry, um, and a couple of the Jewish organizations. Um, usually our, our territory is Bay Ridge. That's where we, we work. But one of the things we wanted to do was in order to get the word out that we were providing this food to people, we wanted to part and make sure we could get that word out. So we spoke with Justin Brandon's office. We spoke with Andrew Gonardis's office. We spoke with Max Rose's office. We spoke with Nicole Malichiakis's office. And we wanted to make sure that their constituents knew that this was available. Um, and because all of those electeds um, represent parts of Bay Ridge, we also had to include all of their district because it would have been terrible for them to get a call for someone and they say, oh, I live in, in Gerritsen Beach, but this is Bay Ridge Cares. So we, we candled <laughs> some of Staten Island. We did Bay Ridge, Diker, Bensonhurst, Gerritsen, Sheepshead Bay, Marine Park, and Manhattan Beach. Um, we covered all of those areas for 14 weeks. And um, thankfully, um, I have to say that uh, we're very proud of the volunteers we had. They did remarkable work. Uh, they were running around all day. And so, um, you know, what we have done is we reserved enough of our COVID relief fund um, on the side so that God forbid, we have to start this whole process all over again we have the ability to do so and we have some funding put aside to be able to accomplish if, if we have to. And then the next big thing coming up is our Thanksgiving meals program, which we do every year. For the past eight years, we've fed around 300 people um, each Thanksgiving. This year, it's a little bit more challenging only because what we usually do is through a partnership with Shore Hill Housing, we would take over their community room and 150 of their um, residents would come down and have dinner served by Bay Ridge Cares and our volunteers. And then another additional 150 meals would be delivered out to the community to people who couldn't afford um, meals on Thanksgiving or seniors who were alone. Uh, because of COVID, obviously gathering 150 people in the community room and you know, 50 volunteers is going to be impossible. So what we have done is um, we've spoken with a caterer who is going to package up uh, Thanksgiving meals for us. And then they will be delivered directly to the homes of the people in the community who need them. And then 150 meals will be dropped off to Shore Hill for their distribution within their own building so that we don't have to send volunteers in, potentially exposing any of their residents to COVID or even the flu at this time. So um, we're very you know, clear about how we can accomplish this without putting anyone at risk. Um, and um, it's gonna look a little different. Usually we serve this on Thanksgiving. Now the meals will be delivered on the day before, which I believe is the 25th of November. We will be putting out information on all our social media and through all the electives office within the next couple of days. So that if you have people who, um, who are in need of a meal on Thanksgiving, you just you know give us a call. Um, and then that we're also adding those people again to the wellness uh, call list. They'll get a call on Thanksgiving just to make sure they're okay. Um, what, I wanna mention that one of the great things about our Thanksgiving's program is it helps us really identify seniors in the community who are at risk. Over the last couple of years, I, we've, we've really identified close to 30 to 40 seniors in the community who have major food inadequacies, are living in, in practical squalor, um, and uh, it, it really puts them on our radar so that we can make sure going past the holiday, they have um, a safety net in place. Um, and we do check up on them and make sure that they have, um, you know, sometimes we just go in and clean their apartment or hire, you know, a cleaning company to go in and clean for them because they can't clean. Or, um, you know, it could be simple things like helping them order something online. Uh, so, um, you know, we bought mattresses for, for seniors who were sleeping on the floor 
in their apartments. So <clears throat> the Thanksgiving program actually get puts our volunteers put eyes on these seniors and we get a really good sense of who needs help and who needs it quickly. So um, that's what's going on with Bay Ridge Cares. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Mm. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, we have a great board of directors. I have to tell you, I have an incredible board that we work with. Um, and But our volunteers are our, our lifeline. And um, they're, they're all residents of Bay Ridge and they're all remarkable. So um, if any of you have helped in the past, thank you so much. Um, but you know, if you haven't, head over to our website. You can become a volunteer right through bayridgecares.org. I have a question. I know you say you call up senior citizens, you know, I get to help, see how they are, or follow up on that. If they don't answer, do you call up the next day? Do you call up later in the day? I mean, what kind of follow up do you do if you don't get a response? We try as best as we can to contact them so we don't stop after one call. Um, there are times, and, and I'm, if my board heard this, they'd yell at me. There was one instance where I was uh, in charge of calling someone and they weren't answering, they weren't answering. And so I went and rang the doorbell. Uh, <laughs> um, only because it, 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 it bothered me that, you know, I, had, I, we wanted to make sure we knew where they were. And it turned out, it was during COVID and it turns out her daughter actually came and picked her up and brought her to Westchester County to stay with her. So, uh, but, but we did try and follow up as much as possible. Well, that's Karen. great. I wanted to say you. to you, Karen, that, um, you know, the board, um, we have a, a very broad based newsletter now and we've been sharing word about Bay Ridge Cares and, and we'll continue to do so. And I think you're doing a great job and um, I'm just so, really, really amazed at, at um, your dynamic group of volunteers, your board, you, and and how much you've done in the community. So I just want to say thank you. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. So, you know what? That is the nicest thing that anybody could say to us. Um, people will say, what can we get you? Can we bring you something? No, and we just say, just say thank you. That's mm -hmm. all. <laughs> and the, you know, there are two underused words in the entire English language. So uh you're very welcome. And we, it, we take a lot of pride in what we do because, you know, we love our community and, um, you know, we want to make sure our seniors especially are so vulnerable. Um, you know, people think Bay Ridge is such a rich community. We have, you know, beautiful homes and no, we have, we have people living in poverty and in, in, in terrible, terrible conditions that uh, is hidden. It, you know, we have this, mm -hmm. this whole segment of, of, people who are poor in private, as I say. And um, it really is, it's heartbreaking when you see it and you are motivated to have to, to do something because no. you would never want your parent to live like that. No, you're absolutely right. And I've seen it from the district office level. It's, you know. Right, we've worked together on a together couple of things. Together on a couple of things, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it's tough. So I, I want to add my thank you as well. And I've learned a lot about Bay Ridge Cares. So I do look forward to working with you in, in probably a number of different capacities. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful, the services that you provide, the connection that you have with the community. We're, you know, we're just so much richer to have, have your organization. So thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Um, what I would like to do now is, is um, move forward, unless there's any other comments. Um, we also have a presentation tonight from um, Bay Ridge Center, specifically on the Bay Ridge Village, which is a program designed to help older adults in the Bay Ridge area stay connected, share information, resources, um, and I know that we have Marianne Nicolosi, Todd is here. So um, however you would like to proceed. Well, Iris, um, actually, I'd like to introduce David Dring. He joined us about a oh, year I'm sorry, ago. David. Uh -huh. And he's our director of innovative programming for older adults. And so he rose to the challenge of COVID-19 by finding a way to get our members online uh, and, and connected. So David, please share with the group. 
Sure, just to kind of start out to make, I'm pretty sure everybody um, is familiar with Bay Ridge uh, Center, but just a couple of things to talk about is relation to the things that happened um, is, you know, the what just what I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've been doing uh, through the pandemic. And what I want to emphasize is that even though the centers have been closed, the staff has still been working. So just like what Karen was talking about in terms of all the excellent work that Bay Ridge Cares has been doing, we've been working on making you know 15,000 wellness check-in calls, um, checking in and delivering and enrolling people to get food in New York City. Um, over the summer, we were able to work with um, a number of people to get air conditions placed. And this is a number that just boggles my mind, but 101,000 home delivered meals were delivered over this seven month period. Um, as well as um, getting a grant to be able to make free Uber rides to folks. We've got all, um, the largest number of social work interns that have been part of our team, um, 17 that we're working with for this year. And then uh, Ruth is online um, and we've been sending out email messages to as many people as we can. And we recognize that the digital divide that you were talking about earlier is very prevalent among this population. So we're delighted that you know 550 email blasts are able to get out to our population to keep them engaged in all the different programs that we're producing. We, um, you know, basically once the pandemic hit, we um, had to change and really pivot from what we were doing, um, you know, in our site to being able to make it go virtual. So very similar to this Zoom meeting, we've been conducting Zoom uh, classroom activities uh, since March. So um, I'm particularly pleased that just three days after the center was closed to individuals, we were able to start launching virtual programs. So it's kind of fun that, you know, we've done 56 art programs since then. And I'm just gonna tell you a little snippet about each kind of category, but we have a local artist, Whitney uh, Hamilton, who is uh, teaching a drawing and watercolor class for us. And she figured out a way to do two, um, uh, to have her laptop and then also her iPhone connected to the Zoom meeting so that she could have her hand be seen in one of these little boxes so that people could actually see her hand movements as well as when she's talking. And I just thought that was extraordinarily creative and, and very fun and also seems to be very helpful. And she's commented that the students of her class have really appreciated this because if you were in a classroom, it would have been harder for each person to be able to see her hand movement. So this is actually an instance when Zoom is, is better than sort of being in real life. Um, we do a, you know, 100 and so uh, education and recreation programs and the creativity of, of our instructors is just really quite remarkable. So the quarantine kitchen is one of the ones that we've um, been able to do. We've done a whole host of health management programs with students from LIU and St. Francis. It's really um, been quite remarkable. And one of the social work students that we've been working with is actually lives and from Hawaii. And so when the pandemic hit, she went back home and so we were able to engage her and collaborate with her, time zone differences aside, um, with her from Hawaii. So it's just, you know, this, the remarkableness of this virtual capability is, is, is quite <laughs> um, spectacular. And Marianne Coughlin, who some of you may know, is our exercise maven. And she's done a phenomenal job with our classes. And she moved upstate uh, for the majority of the pandemic and the, the internet connection up there was pretty lousy. So she was actually going to different neighbors homes and working in their cellars or on their porches or other places to be able to conduct her exercise class. And so there really was a, a sort of a time when each of the students would begin the class, where is Marianne um, in terms of where she's conducting her class today. And, you know, I've been running a host of uh, technology classes, which uh, seemingly have been going pretty well. And it's just been fun. And uh, Jeffrey is actually a part of many of those. And he's been uh, sort of instrumental in changing his virtual background for most of the classes. And it's become a thing for many of the participants to change their background so that it can be 
uh, you know, symbolic of their mood or of just of something that's fun. And uh, it's, it's been really uh, neat to see folks embrace the technology so uh, sort of prevalently. So um, that's, that's been a, a great uh, opportunity for us. And I think that it's really been um, re rewarding for folks to find this as a mechanism to stay connected. Um, I, yeah. I know I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say one thing I do is like on Wednesday, hmm. they, they have a link to a, a Broadway shows where they have different music from different Broadway shows. And I love Broadway, so I have like 350 playbills. So if they do a song and I had the playbill, I post the playbill, so I do things like that. It, it really is wonderful. And we have somebody that has um, the, um, uh, the scene from Sherlock Holmes uh, apartment. Um, we've got you know scenes from the Up movie, from uh, in, in many of uh, the Broadway shows. And one of our participants does a lot with um, places that he's been. So he takes pictures of lakes and boat rides that he's done. So it's just, they just have fun with it. And I think that's really what's so important about it. But um, let me just quickly unshare for a second so I can go and share um, the virtual village so I can give everybody a little bit of a tour of that. And um, I will uh, be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So if I go and share this now, um, so here here is the the Bay Ridge Village, I believe is what I'm on. Yep, and um, this is a a, a similar uh, picture of my uh, background as well. And I'm just I love to uh, show that because it um, actually before I do that. Um, uh, show that because this was taken by one of the students in an uh, earlier digital photography class. But the um, address to the village is very simply bayridgevillage.org. And um, we have one of our uh, interns from last, uh, last uh, session with us. Her name is Rachel, <laughs> Rebecca, and she does a really excellent video um, walking people through uh, the village. And um, it's available for anybody who has any questions can uh, walk through that, which will be very similar to the what, what I'm going to show here. Um, so this is our essentially the landing page for the village. Uh, we have sort of functionality areas really over here in the upper right and then in the upper left, as well as right here in the middle where we direct people to specific resources. Um, so we welcome people. We have a community calendar. I'll, show that to you again. And we also have um, a number of resources and especially wonderful groups that we collaborate with. <laughs> so just wanted to shout out to our friends at the, the Community Board 10 for all the things that we do and you know, making sure that it's easy for people to be able to find different organizations um, in the community that they can um, connect with. Um, what this shows up here is very similar to the the way that you can have uh, special friends and be able to direct to them, um, you know, in, be able to have an instant chat with them, talk with them. Uh, there is a tool that is available here. It's very similar to Zoom. It's called VC, and you can have an instant video chat with any of your friends uh, within the community, just as if you were picking up the phone to make a call with them. Uh, this becomes a place to be able to get notifications we have a series of blogs that we're putting together and people can act and, 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 um, and submit them. So the articles that we create are information that we make available. The blogs are a tool for our community to make available to each other. And we also have forums for folks to be able to use, um, to ask questions of each other and interact with folks. Um, this is always the way you can sort of get back to that home page that we're talking about. We have a member directory of all the different people that we have a part of the service. Um, and we're you know, eagerly working on being able to grow that. Um, we have a, a sort of a, a, a my section here in terms of being able to create the profile. We're able to do mail back and forth to people individually um, and securely access our friends, be able to go to the calendar. And this is the calendar that 
we all see in terms of the activities that um, are happening within our virtual program, which is right now the bulk of our programmatic activities. And so when you click on an item, it gives you all of the details so that if you wanted to go into a class, you can sign in and link directly to that particular class, making it very easy for folks to um, run from this program right into, uh, run essentially go right from the village right into that Zoom session um, that we are making available. Um, the, it is an entire platform that's um, developed. Let's see, where am I gonna get here in terms of talking about all the, the library of articles that we have um, that was really created here for um, the Bay Ridge um, neighborhood. So um, this is an example of the programs that we're doing. Uh, we have uh, poetry that comes out of our virtual classes. We are increasingly um, doing more uh, programming around uh, different uh, Bay Ridge uh, uh, sort of history uh, that are becoming available from within uh, these articles. And um, as I was saying, this is a platform. It's available through a company called Redstring, and we can um, you know, administrate it very simply in terms of creating more content and engagement for folks in the community. So we're really excited about making this become a, a, uh, a real destination for people 60 and over uh, in the Bay Ridge area and have it be a resource for them to, um, you know, just to, 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 to participate with each other and to build the community and find deeper ways of in engaging with it. So I, I know I often talk pretty quick, so um, I hope I was able to give you guys a, a pretty good uh, sense of things and happy to answer any questions. And I guess I should ask Todd if I did okay. You did okay. Oh, you. You should have asked me. Uh -oh. uh, so, so if I could just jump in to, to add a point of clarity. The, the idea of the Bay Ridge Village is cr to create a platform that is, is somewhat insular. So older adults who use it don't have to go to a Facebook or a YouTube or they don't have to try to navigate the entire web they can go to the village and access their favorite places safely and their favorite people safely. So, so it, it, it is somewhat, um, it, it makes it easier for us to help people who, who are not naturally educated in digital programming um, to get them across that divide. So that, so that we don't have to introduce them to a whole internet web browser field. We can, we can have them come into the village, find their friend, instantly contact them and have a conversation. Um, the same thing, come into the village, looking for a class, look at the calendar, get into the class, be with the people they wanna be with. Um, and, and I want to, um, I actually want to, to give a shout out to Jeffrey, um, because I think that he's probably, um, a good spokesperson for how effective virtual programming has been in, in, in helping with the systemic isolation that comes with, um, <coughs> with the sheltering in place that we've had to adapt to. Do you mind me putting you on the spot, Jeffrey? No, um, basically, I'll tell you what it is. Um, I guess I am I sort of isolated. Um, I don't have a big family. I have, an old, I have an older sister who's married in Jersey. They have no kids. Um, both of my parents are dead. Um, my, my uncle never had any... Um, Hold on, I want to put this on mute. Be right back. <laughs> Let me call you back in about 10 minutes. I'm on I'm on a Zoom course. I'll call you back. <laughs> um, so um and I really don't have that many. That was my one friend. Um <laughs> I don't really have that many, no, I don't have that many that many real friends. Um 
So COVID affected me that not loneliness, but I found out going to these classes, I have more friends now, you know, and open up meeting new people and things like that. So I'm not as isolated as I have been. So it, it, it sort of opened up, you know, opened up the world for me, made me less isolated. So I found it very good, you know, so. I don't know if you have any questions you want to ask me, but if you do, ask. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. I, I think this is amazing. Uh, yes, I think this is amazing. And um, like everything else with COVID, it's just accelerating all problems <coughs> that we might have had um, throughout society for many years, and it's just being mm. unearthed. And um, I, I want to thank. Uh, so much because this is a very important topic and I appreciate um, I appreciate how well it's being um, recepted uh, so I hope it continues and um, I'm just a little bit overwhelmed because it's a very important topic the elderly and uh, being um, not having a lot of connection to other people so yeah Thank you. Okay, David, would it be possible um, for us to put um, all of this information as part of a link on our website? Oh, that would be great. Okay, yeah. great. And vice, versa. And, and vice versa, you know, maybe yeah, yeah. put our information up on yours as well. Absolutely. Okay, um, I thank have, you. I have to say that we post every single one of their announcements on our mailing list. We have about, in our law firm, because we're an elder law firm, we have about 3,000 mem uh, members, uh, participants, people who either are caregivers or the elders themselves. And we constantly, and we get such good feedback. Thank you for sending this information. I hope they're signing up for classes, but uh, we keep trying, we keep getting the word mm -hmm. out. And I think any organization, whether the synagogue could post it, whether, um, because it's it'll only build the village because it is such a special opportunity and um, resource for older people. Um, I know Jeffrey took some of the classes I did on the, on the, the Bay Ridge Village. And right, um, yeah. Gomali, they did, I, I guess they did about a week or two of classes, which was very yeah. good, yes. So it's a way to keep expanding and thank you for resharing. Um, you know, I just wanted to ask, because I, I know we get this at the district office, and, and Mary, maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, in, in speaking about the digital divide, do you think there's any way that we can help or apply for grants that, that help seniors who don't have the computer software at home? You know, we've, um, we've had some seniors borrow some of our, you know, um, iPads, tablets, um, you know, as a board, we don't we don't really have those resources, but there are a few people said I'd like to join, but I, I don't even know how to open up a computer or, right. or I don't have not even a smartphone. So can you talk a little bit how maybe we can work um, on on helping those seniors who would like to to learn um, and, and just, are, you know, how do we bridge that gap to get them on the village is, is my question. I swear I didn't pay her to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> No, no, in all seriousness, we obviously we're, we're bumping into that problem all the time. Um, we, we, we started a loaner program ourselves, giving our, our iPads, and we, um, we, we connected to T-Mobile, was it, that we got the hotspot? So the, the problem with our seniors is much worse than just not having a device. It's that they don't have the internet hookup. They don't have the, the actual ability to log on to broadband. They don't have Wi-Fi. They don't, it, they just, and, and the cheapest price for doing that is like $40 a month. And it, it becomes, a, it really becomes a problem. Um, additionally, um, we're, we're looking into, we're, we've been writing grants and, and trying to get um, into, into a pilot program um, in order to purchase, um, actually not, not a tablet, because what we're finding and what most individuals will, who work in this field will tell us is that older people, as they get older, they really can't handle tablets and they can't see phones. It's all too small. 
So we, you really need a, a substantial desktop yeah. or it, at least a screen and, and hopefully a touch screen. Um, so so we're, we're looking into it. We're partnering with some folks who did this incredible project in the UK um, for Holocaust survivors and got 500 people over the age of 80 trained in using these the the same things we're talking about using and and the only the only um the only way that people stop using it for them is when those older adults die once they give them the machine and give them access and give them the platform they 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 use it as a in a very very vital link to their entire entire social network so um yeah i would love to i would love to work with the community i mean, i i think it would be great if we could um and i know the city's thinking about trying to somehow get stuff you know <laughs> digital stuff for older adults my fear is that they're going to keep throwing these eight inch tablets at them and they just can't right right it, it's I just see. very difficult um and and the real issue is as david will tell you is that that it's a foreign language once you get them everything they need now you have to introduce them to the language of how to get online and how to be able to do things yeah. so, so i i would love anybody who wants to work with this yeah come on we'll do it yeah so, so so the yes can I make a suggestion? Yes. So my mom, 84, was very reluctant to use any kind of iPad, iPhone, computer, because she didn't have anybody to teach her, okay. right? And so we were there to teach her, but there's a lot of people that might not have that. So is there any way that we could maybe have a, I mean, when COVID, or even with COVID, at the community board um, office, maybe have some classes for, you know, elderly people who might be able to get there to um, like, like an Apple, you know. Yeah, we did talk to, about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, we really did. Yeah. We, we started to explain, to, to, how, to explain how to use it. Or maybe if um, they can partner, this organization can partner up with the library who has bigger screens that um we have a giant people. smart board now in the community board office yeah i know i know <laughs> so i think that, that would be great to introduce um older people to understand how to use these tablets or computers so that might be an idea yeah i think even all. maybe partnering with even some of the local high schools we did that at senior tech a few times and those were the longest lines at senior tech were volunteers and students my daughter was actually one of them one year um, who had these really long lines and, and people just really were like here's my device just teach me so i think that we should work on that i think that would be a good committee project, you know, a, a good collaborative effort um, with the Bay Ridge Center. And certainly, you know, it, it's, it's going to be challenging getting off the feet during COVID. But as we roll through, I think certainly um, we have a, you know, our office is open. And, and I think that would be a great um, place. And, and we could talk about how we could actually get that done. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, are you, um, Josephine, are you familiar with Joe Alvear over at Fort Hamilton High School? No. Yeah. I, yeah, I Joe, so you so you know him, Todd. So Joe Joe runs a um, 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 a volunteer program over at Fort Hamilton High School. They do their kids come and do a lot of our events with them. But they have about four hundred of their students who look to do community service, not for any other reason except to they want to help. And these are young kids who are available during the daytime that can meet up with seniors. Um, so that might be um, I can I can shoot you over Joe Alvear's information. That'd He's got a wonderful yeah. group of kids there. Okay, great. Okay. I just want to um, sort of ahead, echo David. some of what Marianne was saying in terms of... David, just hold on one second, because I know you'll have more to respond to. Let Ruth speak briefly, and then we'll sure. ask you to talk. Hi, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to... Uh, I love this conversation. I think it's terrific, and I want a high school kid to help me. <laughs> <laughs> fabulous idea I just wanted to mention two things uh, one is that at the Bay Ridge Jewish Center 
we closed on March 4, uh, 13th or whatever it was, like everyone else around town. And we switched very quickly to online services, online meetings, online everything. Uh, we wound up uh, giving iPads to a number of people who wanted them. And um, I have to say that, and, and a lot of seniors um, who didn't want iPads join in by phone to services, and they're happy with that. Um, so, uh, you know, like a lot of the organizations, we did the same thing, and, and that worked, and we can continuing we will have to continue to get better at it also. Um, something um, I wanted to add is that I have a friend, a fellow in the neighborhood. Uh, he's a senior and retired. And what he does for a hobby is that he um, takes old computers and upgrades them. And then he gives them away gives them to kids who can't afford them or gives them to anybody. And I'm really sure that, um, you know, he'd be happy to make a connection with one of your organizations. And I mean, I'm speaking for him so generously, you know, <laughs> uh, it's always easy to give someone else a task, right? <laughs> so um, he, he usually gets it through, his wife works for a, a very big corporation and they constantly upgrade their computers, and that's how he gets them, and he fixes them up. So I can speak to him. If you're interested in uh, upgraded desktops, I can make that connection either with you, David, or Karen. Uh, yeah, I see you shaking your head, David. Is that yep. something that appeals to you? Okay. Yep. I'm uh, putting in uh, my email address uh, within the chat so that you would... Um, have it for a way to reach me after you talk to the fellow. I certainly will. That's terrific. David, David thank you. Firm, David, this is Judy. Our firm yep. has probably going to have within the next month um, 25 full sets of uh, desktop towers because we're converting all to laptops. Because of people moving back and forth from home to work, we okay. use they all have to be using laptops. So all the towers are going to become obsolete. So once we get people cleaned up, you know, and they'll, and they'll come with the screen. So we we'll okay. able to do that. I, we were, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with all these towers. Now, uh, to now <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and you can call them a donation. Very generous of you. Yes. That's one. Um, yeah. I, I and, and, we're, and we're taking, we're contributing to the carbon footprint of taking yeah. things and right. recycling them. You know, there's a huge shortage right now for devices because uh, so many people working from home and kids and stuff. It's really the long wait for even all the little tablets. So mm -hmm. if we can recycle, sure. David, is there anything else? I know I stopped you before. Is there anything else you want to add? I, I did want to um, sort of piggyback on one thing that Marianne was saying, which is that the, the device is certainly a challenge for people to be able to get. But the, I think the real impediment to a number of older adults is the ongoing internet connectivity fees. And there are a couple of programs that Verizon does as well as Spectrum to offer a little bit lower cost services, but to enroll in those is fairly cumbersome and um, they're not necessarily as cheap as other programs. And not to be saying anything disparaging about the programs that are available for low income families, but if a child receives a hot meal at school, then they're automatically eligible to be able to receive um, a low cost internet um, at only about $10 um, a month. That same program is and the same eligibility requirements is not available to older adults. It's much more uh, stringent. So if there would be you know, one way for a, a, a sort of a community district or a, a, a coalition of folks to to sort of speak up is is really around how we can advocate for equitable, low cost internet connectivity for seniors. It's a tremendous health issue in terms of being able to see their doctors, because um, now a lot of that is happening virtually. It's a tremendous, um, you know, basic service, uh, being able to order food or to be able to communicate with people, receive information. So much of it is happening now electronically to exclude a, a whole swath of the population is is really a detriment. 
So um, I just wanted to sort of throw in a, a, a comment about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that may be a segue for me to tell you a little bit about my agency. Before I do, I just want one other clarification. I know I was present when we sort of cut the ribbon and open Bay Ridge Connects. So the Bay Ridge Village is, uh, is that, that is part of Bay Ridge Connects. And this is something that will live on long after COVID. Correct. Um, so it, it is a, a little bit of, or, or a lot of Bay Ridges, but um, it sort of starts off with Bay Ridge Center, which is essentially the headquartering, headquarters organization. And then the satellite office, uh, Bay Ridge Connects is actually a, natu a neighborhood naturally occurring retirement community. It's called a, an NNORC uh, that's funded by the state. And then with some of that funding, we've been able to create the Bay Ridge Village to be available to everyone in Bay Ridge community. That's, you know, essentially because of the funding, it's sort of targeted for people who are 60 and over, but, you know, family members and others will certainly be welcome within the community. Fantastic. Yeah, Iris, the, the, the concept of, of developing the village really almost grew out of our home delivered meals program and recognizing that those folks, at least they had our drivers coming every day but they didn't really have an opportunity to interact with, with the larger community very well. So we started talking about Barrage Village for them and then COVID happened. And we realized that it needed to be a lot bigger than just that little focus program. Um, and, and in all honesty, you know, David, David Dring is, is a master in aging and technology is, yes. is known nationally for it. And we, we looked out and we walked through Barrage Center's doors about a year ago, just in time for this whole mess to happen. So, um, so I'm very grateful that, that you know, it's, it's, it's great to have a vision, but visions don't work without someone who can implement them. But um, enough of us. <laughs> yeah. I want to give David a compliment also. He does a lot of technology courses. And the thing with the technology courses, some people are on a PC, some are on an iPhone, some are on a tablet, some are Apple, some are Android, and he knows them all and how to handle it all very well. And that's very hard to do and juggle. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so well, I said this is a natural segue. I also want to give an update about the organization that I'm affiliated with and that's um, the Bay Ridge Counseling Center. Um, the Bay Ridge Counseling Center is on 92nd Street. It's a program of the Jewish Board. I've spoken about it before at this committee meeting and at the board. Um, but I wanna also say what we've been doing during this time. And I think also what we've been talking about is how we've all utilized technology to get services to people in need. And, um, yeah, I think if, if there's something good that is coming out of this, you know, looking for the good things that have come out of it, I think this has really pushed the use of technology ahead in ways that we will continue to use it going forward and then be able to reach more people. So um, the Bay Ridge Counseling Center, it's an Article 31 OMH licensed mental health clinic. Um, we sort of mid-size average about 650 active clients. Um, I personally was actually, I'm the director of the clinic and I had um, a knee replacement in January. And so I was due to return to the clinic the first week of April. And so, you know, I've been you know, doing this uh, in place, working from another setting for, for longer than, than some others. Mm -hmm. um, with that, all of our services were on site, as you would assume a traditional mental health clinic. About a third of our clients are under the age of 18, many referred from the local schools. We have family counseling, individual counseling groups, work with teens, work with older adults. So it's, it's really a very broad base need. Um, most of our clients are working, going to school, doing well in the community. 
some of our clients have severe persistent mental illness and are not um, as independent, but it, it is for people who can independently live in the community. Um, so what we did, and I was a little bit of a spectator at the time, is as was said by others, we transitioned to technology in a very short span of time. So I think it was March 20th that um, we all started working virtually. And the clinic never closed, although for a period of time, the doors were closed. Um, all of our therapists immediately began working online, primarily using Zoom. But as been discussed tonight, some of our clients didn't have access, weren't familiar with. Um, therapists became technology supports and assistance, helping people get on Zoom. Um, so, and, and some of my, my therapists needed help getting on Zoom, um, but we all did it. And um, it's really quite remarkable but also so needed because I think what we've all seen during this time is an escalation of depression, um, serious mental health challenges that have come out of um, more isolation, um, losses, people who have lost family and friends to COVID, um, just you know, all of our lives being upside down, turned upside down. And really it is, it is a trauma. It is a shared trauma that we're all experiencing. So mental health services have been really critically in need and have escalated. I have to say, unfortunately, we're seeing people come to us um, in greater crisis, sicker, um, coming from hospitals. We created our own, what we're calling 911 clients. It's anyone that calls in and seems to have any kind of suicidal ideation, we, we connect them immediately that day. Um, and we have seen a real increase in that. I looked at numbers this morning just to get a sense because intakes have been extremely busy and you know the month is not over and we've had 59 new clients come on just this month. So um, there is a great need. And um, so I do want to put it out there. I want everyone to know that we're there, that we're working. We also now are physically open. Um, our clinic is actually open normally um, six days a week. So it's Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., Friday, 9 to 5, and Saturday, 9 to 5. Um, now that we have reopened, we are physically open on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Tuesday and Wednesday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and Thursday, 9 to 5. Um, that will probably expand, but we're just, you know, keep taking stock every few weeks, see what the needs are. We've got tremendous health and safety um, protocols and even our limitation, you know, with our CFO, we're only able to have half the amount of people. So we're not encouraging people to come on site if they can um, connect with us through technology. Um, as long as their needs are met that way, we would, we would like to continue that way. Um, but, but we have staff that are physically now, more, more of them are on site doing some remote work as well as seeing clients face to face. Um, I want to say, I'm, I'm going to also just kind of give our number and the, the process by which anyone can um, reach out for services, but I also want to say that this new use of technology, um, you know, my sense, as long as Office of Mental Health, Mental Hygiene allows us to continue in this way, um, everyone will, because we're reaching people that might not have come into a clinic for a wide host of reasons. Um, so, you know, again, I think that's a good thing and, and something that we will be able to continue in the future. So what I want to say is that Jewish Board is a very large organization. 
even though we are very community based. Um, there is a central point of intake. So anyone who is interested in services does need to make a phone call. And our number is one, oh, just 844. And then it's one call, O-N-E-C-A-L-L. And those numbers become 844-663-2255. And then they connect with someone, get some basic information, get a sense of what the need is, and then can connect the client with any of the clinics. Um, there are, I think, 12 clinics citywide. Um, but we primarily serve Bay Ridge, Diker Heights, and the Fort Hamilton community. But um, if someone is in need and for whatever their convenience is, they prefer to, to be with us, we can, can work with them. And then again, now with technology and working remotely, we even have um, you know, a greater span. So I did just wanna make sure everyone knows that we are there, we're working, we're very much available um, to anyone in need. Anybody have any questions or thoughts? Karen? You're muted. I hate these things. Um, just, is there a cost uh, involved here, Iris? You take every insurance there is. Okay. Um, if someone does not have insurance, um, there's, they can pay privately and there's a, a, a sliding scale fee. Um, you know, we work well with people to make sure it's available to them. Great. Um, yeah. So pretty much though, with insurance, we do ask them to pay their copay. Okay. I just needed uh -huh. to know that because there are times where we run into some of the caseworks, the individual caseworker work that we do with uh, someone going through crisis. A lot of times we will see that there is an underlying depression or, or something that needs to be addressed. So having this information mm -hmm. available to us is really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And if for um, some reason, maybe, I know can I just finish the sometimes like Sorry. everybody has medicaid and it's lapsed maybe because of their depression they didn't recertify or something will our fiscal office will help them do whatever they'll do it for okay. them okay thank you welcome um yeah i've been listening i know there's a lot of lot of organizations and a lot of take things to take in here is anybody who maybe could aggregate this all and maybe it could be posted let's say on bay ridge village or something yeah. you know as a list of resources yeah, I'm going to be able to do that or hope to try to do that. I do. I will do a report from this committee meeting. Um, it will be sent out. To, um, and, and I will, yes, and Jeffrey, I will add you to our email blast list so you will get all of our notifications with all of this information. Yeah. Thank you. With yeah. that, because yeah. we've provided so much information, if anyone, if you have a concise piece of information to get out the word best about your organization if you presented tonight and want to share that with me I that would I would really appreciate it it'll you know it's, it's sometimes hard to condense the material and really do it all justice okay um, you have Jay Gold uh, Goldfinger from assembly member Matilda Frontis's office okay. yes uh, thank you just a quick question. Have you had any issues with um, reimbursement rates? Has there been any uh, differential between in-person care and telemedicine? Um, you know, it's interesting because no, I mean, I, I have an office manager, we have a big fiscal department, so I'm, I'm not as directly related to that, but I would say if anything, um, it's making it easier for clients. There are some, I actually also have a private practice and clinical social worker. Um, so I know with Emblem, Beacon, G, sort of the GHI format, um, not collecting co-pays. So there may be some, some additional assistance for clients that way, but it, it goes by different insurance. So. Yeah, I mean, I know that during um, COVID, Medicaid started reimbursing at the same rate. I didn't know if all private insurers 
have been yeah. following so yeah. if that's been an issue. Okay. Yeah, no, we are, but I will tell you that it's kind of a month to month that's getting approved through OMH. It keeps getting approved and nobody's expecting it to, you know, go away quickly. Right. But um, I have to leave, so I was just wanted to say goodbye. I apologize. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank so good you. to see you. Yes. So yeah, it, it, it isn't a hindrance. And if in, in some ways it may actually become more affordable for clients in that instance with that copay, but it's by different insurers. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, so I think this gives us a little time maybe to have a bite before watching the debate, if we <laughs> can that plan. What debate? Uh, <laughs> I think I'll watch the giant game. It'll be less stressful. Probably. <laughs> it's the Eagles game. Karen Excuse me, <laughs> Mr. G. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank Thanks for having for us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Yeah, you, you too, Jeffrey.